The title of the sermon today is From Chaos to Creation. From Chaos to Creation. We're going to be talking about faith and fear this morning. I think the way we're going to attack this is going to be in a way that you've never heard it before, and I think it will expand your thinking because fear brings chaos. It brings uncertainty. It brings uh, a lack of stability. When you're in fear or a group of people's in fear, it's kind of like having your house built on the rock and the sand. When you're in fear, anything that happens around you moves you. You know what I'm talking about? Like, do you remember when you were a kid? How many of you were, when you were a kid and you were afraid of the dark, you know, or maybe afraid of being at home by yourself? Or I remember growing up, we had a house with wood floors that was on like uh, stilts, you know, like those old houses where the the floor just speaks, you know, it just makes noises. I mean, it could be like three mile an hour wind and my floor's like, and I always just, at night, I would just hear those. It almost sounds like footsteps just to get you scared before I talk about faith. And uh, I remember as a kid, I'd be so nervous because you had all these little sounds, you know. And I don't know about you, but here's how I kind of like overcome that. So if I was home by myself, my parents weren't there, I would, uh, did you ever like act like you were bigger than you are or that there were more people there? Anyone ever do that? Like you have a conversation, you're like, hey, Bill, do you have the gun? Yeah, I've got it right here. Okay, good. Let's, don't shoot it yet. Let's see if, I'm, you know, and you just say whatever thinking if somebody's in here, they're going to be scared. Like they had no idea. That's what that eight-year-old kid was doing, you know. Uh, Hey, is everybody here? Yeah, we're here. Cool. You got the missiles? Yeah, we got the missiles. All right, here we go. So fear kind of creates this lack of confidence in our life. And the book of Genesis talks about chaos and creation. And I want you to see how God handles chaos because we are in a chaotic season of the world. And even if the world didn't seem as crazy as it did, we all have seasons of our life that are maybe out of order, it seems, or chaotic, or we don't understand why things are happening. I'm going to give you some revelation that will help set you up to be who God's called you to be in these last days. Because it doesn't matter if Iran attacks Israel. It doesn't matter if they build a temple or sacrifice red heifers or China gets upset and Russia and they want to fight against everybody. It doesn't matter. Because once you know why you're put on this earth, are you ready for this? When you're submitted to the plan of God for your life, you are immortal. You can't die until your work is finished. I didn't say somebody couldn't die unless their work is finished. I said if you're submitted to God, serving him, then you are immortal until your work on earth is finished. That means you cannot die until you're done. Jesus had to decide to go to the cross. It wasn't they forced him to go to the cross. He subjected himself to the cross, just like Isaac, where he said, Dad, where's the sacrifice? Well, the Lord will provide it. And he's like, yeah, I know exactly what that means. That means it's me. And guess what? Isaac walked to the altar and laid himself on the altar. So it's... There's a lot to this. Let's just go to Genesis 1. I'm trying to, like, hold it back. All right, Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. We're going to read verses 1 through 4. If you're not taking notes, you're going to want to today. Verse 1 says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Verse 2. The earth was without form and void. Darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now, I want you to see how God reacted to that word. those words, without form and void, speak of chaos. So God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth is chaotic. So something happened. Now there's a chaotic earth. God doesn't create chaos. But the way God responded to the chaos was not how we sometimes would respond to a chaotic situation. It says in verse 3, he said, let there be light, and there was light. Verse 4, and God saw, he saw what? The light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. You know when you know you're going somewhere and you just can't wait to get there, and it's almost like, funny because y'all have no idea. I'm just going to relish in this moment right now. So follow me for a second. So God is, is, he creates the universe perfectly. There's a chaotic situation. We're not going to go into all that and all the theories of why it became chaotic and void. Without form, chaotic and dark, scripture says. The way God responds to it is not by describing the situation. He speaks the solution to the situation. He doesn't say, man, I didn't create it like this. Why is it so dark? 
Why is it so chaotic? Hey, Michael, did you see this? Look how chaotic that is. Look how dark the earth is. I'm light, but look how dark that is. No, we do that. We go, look at the problem. Man, that problem's amazing. Man, how'd that get there? I wonder why it happened. Pastor, can you help me? What's wrong with me? What's wrong with you? What's wrong with the world? Why is this happening? We, we describe what we see. God speaks solutions, answers. And he says, light be is how it is said in Hebrew. Let there be light. He saw the light and it was good. Now, Philippians 4.8 says something very important because we're talking about observation today. And it says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate and think on these things. Nothing in that description spoke of chaos, fear, uh, destruction. Our thought life should be on what is good. And God responded answered the darkness and the chaos with light, and then he saw and he observed the goodness of the light that he spoke into existence. You notice how God's not observing chaos, speaking about it. He's answering it, and he's looking at the solution. Genesis 1, 2 in the living says it like this. Uh, actually, Genesis 1, 1 through 3 in the Living Bible. When God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was shapeless, chaotic mass, and the Spirit of God was brooding over the dark vapors. Then God said, let there be light, and light appeared. Now, as I was praying over this service this week, and by the way, I was preparing for eight episodes on the podcast and a sermon this Sunday. So that's why I was late this morning to come into church, and I was late in worship because I was still moving stuff around, okay? so, But as I was praying over the service this week, and I read the first three verses. God led me to Genesis 1, and this is what he said to me. If you observe the chaos, you won't take part in the creation. If you observe the chaos, you won't take part in the creation. Now, I said won't take part because it's a decision to observe and describe and to meditate on what the enemy is doing in the world or what he's doing in your life. And if you're observing chaos, you can't simultaneously declare darkness and chaos and declare peace, order, and light. You're either speaking destruction, darkness, chaos, or you're speaking order, peace, the truth of God's word, and the light of God's word. Your mouth tells on you. I could spend five minutes with anybody and know where they are spiritually. I can, even if you're trying not to reveal it, it you, the Bible says, Jesus said it this way, out of the abundance of your heart, what's deep inside of you, your mouth erupts or speaks. That means you're going to say, have you ever said something you regret and told the person you didn't mean that? Well, you're not going to admit. Have you, anyone else said it to you where they said, I didn't mean what I said? Anyone ever heard it? Like, I didn't mean that. and It was hurtful. They did mean it. It was from their heart. Why? Because there are things in here that you cannot keep there without your mouth telling on you. It's scriptural principle. You can try your best. So here's what I want you to see. If you are declaring destruction, chaos, darkness, the problems of the world, negative, all the things of this world, then that means your heart is full of destruction, chaos, fear, and all the things of this world. If you're speaking God's word, truth, life, then your heart is full of that. So the heart is really the issue when we're talking about faith versus fear. Now, Luke 21 tells us in the last days that men's hearts will fail them from fear. Luke 21, 26. Once again, in the last days, this is Jesus speaking, he said fear is going to be one of the descriptive words of this generation. They're going to be so afraid that their hearts will fail them. So fear is a major part of the world that we're living in. I remember when coronavirus issue three years ago first kind of hit, you know, and some people were like, man, they're, you know, they weren't even worried about it. That's the people that don't wash their hands and share drinks with people they don't know and stuff like that. But me, I'm what they call a clean person. You know, anyone in here clean? No, I'm just, that sounds, that sounds offensive. But you know what I mean? I'm a, they say germaphobe, but I'm not speaking negativity. I'm speaking life. I like a lack of germs, okay, in my life. So I'm a very, like, just overly obsessed person. about. Like, I wash my hands so much, my hands are always dry. You know, I'm that person. So when the, the kind of word got out that there's some virus going around, 
Some people were like, oh, God's faithful. That was a test for my faith. I was like, oh, man, okay, because I'm like normally that way. Like if it's like, you know, cold season or whatever, people are sneezing everywhere. If somebody sneezes or coughs in a grocery store, my wife can attest to this, I will not walk through that cough within like five minutes. Like if I'm walking down the aisle, someone's like, oh, chew. I'm like, I'm going to go down the other aisle. I just, because I see it floating and then I'm like, it's almost like a spider web. I just walk in it. Some of y'all don't notice. And now you're like, why do I keep getting sick? Because you're walking through sneezes. Okay. So, but I, I, so whenever all this coronavirus stuff happened, I was like, oh man, this is, this is going to be tough. Like, and it was amazing because I like went overboard. I know that's shocking to you, but I was like, babe, here's the deal. And we had every sanitizer. We already had every sanitizer, but I like tripled, tripled up on all of it. I mean, I don't remember. I even ordered, I remember when this first happened, because this was before anyone knew. I actually knew about it before the public did, because I was following this kind of information outlet that was saying stuff, and it was like a month and a half before anyone did. And so a month and a half before anyone knew what COVID was or coronavirus, I was like, babe, there's something happening in China right now. I ordered a hazmat suit on Amazon. No joke. It's like a full body hazmat suit with gloves and a mask and a helmet and everything. And she's like, and of course, remember, it's not on the news cycle yet. So my wife, if she didn't already think I was crazy, she definitely did at this moment. She's like, babe, we got a package. I'm like, yeah, what is it? Uh, it's a hazmat suit. Why? Because there's sneezes going on around the world and coughs, and I don't want to be involved in this. So my point is, whenever you meditate on something, whatever's in your heart, you are going to, not only is your mouth going to say it, but your actions follow what you believe on the inside. Faith without works is dead. What is that saying? If you have faith in here, then your life will show it on the outside. Words and actions follow your heart. Once again, it all points to the heart. What is in our hearts? And you might say, well, I don't know. Why is fear really that big a deal? I mean, I'm not a fearful person. You might say that, but you're thinking of fear in one dimension. I'm not just speaking of fear like watching a horror movie or going to a haunted house or being scared of something. Fear is the opposite spiritual force of faith. So the Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. We can't receive anything from God without faith. Guess what? Fear? You want to receive something from the kingdom of darkness? Fear is the access point to receive from the enemy. As faith works with the kingdom of God, fear works with the kingdom of darkness. And so fear cannot have place in our lives, our words, or our heart. 2 Timothy 1.7 says this, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, listen to this, but power, love, and a sound mind. You're going to love this. You know the word sound mind means this, an orderly, controlled mind. What's the opposite of an orderly, controlled mind? Chaos. So we're seeing now the scriptures interpreting itself, and we're seeing that a chaotic, uncontrolled situation, maybe without any kind of understanding of what's going to come next, is the result of fear in our life. But it also says God gives us power. That means fear weakens you spiritually. Because power, love, and a sound mind are the antidotes to fear. He says, no, God hasn't given us fear, but that means in place of that, that means on the opposite end of the spectrum with the kingdom of God, it's not fear, it's power, love, and a sound mind. When you're afraid, you become self-centered, right? If you're in fear, the only thing you're thinking about is you and how things affect you. I'm afraid, why? Because I might not have enough. I might get hurt. This might happen to me. Now, so love is what? Outwards focused. So fear, the opposite of fear is power because it brings weakness. It's love because it brings self-centeredness or selfishness. And it's soundness controlled mind because it brings chaos. Now I'm going to give you three points today and we're going to talk about David and Goliath. And I want to talk about David and Goliath because there's some revelation in 1 Samuel 17 that I think we've skipped over. And I want to show you how this relates to where we are in the world today. Turn your Bible to 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17. And we're actually going to read um, through verse 11 here, but we're also going to kind of skim through and skip around through chapter 17 to get through the whole thing. So don't worry, I'm not going to read the entire story of David and Goliath. But I want to give you a point today. We're talking about faith and fear. 
And here's the truth I want you to write down. There's three truths I want you to catch today. Number one, faith and fear work through observation. They work through observation. Whatever you observe, we've talked about it before, or meditate on. To meditate means to think about, to talk about over and over. Whatever you observe or meditate on, you are empowering in your life. And there are only two spiritual forces in this class. Now, there are other spiritual forces. There's love. There's, you know, there's hatred. There's light and darkness. There's, there's you know, all kinds of forces. But I'm talking about how we receive from the... There's only two kingdoms. By the way, if you're a guest today, Christianity is not a religion. I hate to shock you with that. The Bible doesn't nowhere say that Christianity is a religion. Jesus said, I'm a king, and I have a kingdom and I've come to bring my kingdom to the earth, and the Bible calls us ambassadors, we are now uh, emissaries of the kingdom of God. When you begin to see things from a kingdom perspective, you will really interpret Scripture correctly. You can misunderstand. And when I say religion, I don't mean religion's bad. Religion has a place. Religion, the Bible says, is the works. It's the outward show. Pure undefiled religion is this, to visit the widow and orphan in need. What does that mean? Religion is an action. It is how we act out what we believe inside. But we are members not of a religion, but of a kingdom. We're part of a, a royal family. So whenever you're observing things in your life, you are, there's a kingdom of light and darkness, that's it. So if you're observing light, truth, God's word, what God has said, then you are increasing and activating your faith. Faith comes by hearing. And hearing by what? The Word of God. Now, when I say observation, I don't just mean look. I mean to behold. That means to hear, to see, to keep in front of you. Fear comes the same way. From beholding, hearing, speaking the things that the enemy is doing in our life. So fear and faith work through observation. Once again, fear works through observing chaos. Now let's read 1 Samuel 17. This is going to make some sense here. We're going to kind of bring it all home in this story. I love the story of David and Goliath because we've all heard it so much that we become numb to it. And I want you to act like you've never heard this before because the worst thing you can do, here's a warning, is to read the scripture like you already know that. Because when you read the word and you go, I remember hearing this before, you're going to read it quicker and you're going to assume you understand all the revelation and everything God's saying. Can I tell you something? For eternity, you'll be understanding new sides of God and more revelation to him. You're never arriving where you understand it all. So verse 1, 1 Samuel 17 says this. Now the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle and gathered in Sako, which belongs to Judah. And they encamped between Sako and Azekah in Ephestamim. I'm saying that in Hebrew. Okay, so, and Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and they encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in battle array against the Philistines. So you have a valley in between. You have two mountains on either side. And you have the Philistines on one side, one mountain, and Israel on the other mountain. Verse 3. The Philistines stood on a mountain on one side and Israel... See? I just said that. All right. Verse 4. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath. So Goliath is now going out into the valley in between the two armies. Goliath is uh, a Nephilim, Scripture tells us. He's part of the Anakim, which are uh, descendants of angels having babies with women. Man, you thought the Bible was boring. It's not. Genesis 6, all right? So these were the giants of old, Scripture tells us. So we think we've seen giants. But let me tell you, this is a different scenario. These are part angelic fallen beings and part human. I mean, you think, you know, all of these X-Men and all this stuff, oh, this is some new idea. Someone created this great idea. No, everything, the Bible said it all first, and everybody just tweaked it and tried to make it interesting in their own way. Goliath is a descendant of angels and humans. He's part fallen angel and part human. I want you to hear this. Okay, that's the Bible, not me. All right. Then he goes on to say, it goes on in verse 4, he went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. He was almost... Uh, People say it differently, but around 10 feet tall. 10 feet tall, okay? So he's 10 feet tall. Then it says he had a bronze helmet on his head and was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. 126 pounds was just the armor that he wore on his chest. Imagine walking around with 126 pounds just of a breastplate armor. 
okay? So this is like a very imposing figure, Scripture is telling us. Then it goes on in verse 6. He had a bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders, and the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels, and a shield bear went before him. 600 shekels is 16 pounds. So he had a spear... And remember, come on, physics people, science people. I mean, this. so if you have a spear, the longer the spear is that has 16 pounds at the end of it, the harder it is to hold it up, right? I mean, we can all hold up 16 pounds, you know, with a six-inch stick or something. But you take a five-foot, six-foot, eight-foot, 10-foot, 12-foot spear, then you put 16 pounds on the end. Let's see how many of you can hold it up. So just think about the strength and the size, the, how imposing he was. And then it goes on to say in verse 8, He stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you're the servants of Saul? Are they the servants of Saul? Nope. Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy, this is not a good thing to say, by the way, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And when Saul and all of Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Saul was the largest man in Israel, the king. He was the biggest in the military. Some say he's 6'5", 6 6'6", six, six to 6'8". Everybody else was smaller than him. Saul is not only the leader, but he's also the largest, most imposing warrior. And it says he and all of his military are greatly afraid. So we're seeing something now. Fear works through observation. I want you to catch this because the enemy is the same. He's still doing the same things. He has the same weapons. By the way, the only weapon he has is deception. And here's how he uses it. If fear comes through observation, then what's he going to do? He's going to try to make what you're observing very imposing. He's going to try to get you from out of faith because faith is the opposite of observing with your eyes. That's what fear results from. Faith is not what your eyes see. It's believing in spite of what your eyes see. Ready for this? So if Satan wants you to be in fear because that's how his kingdom operates and gets you to receive then he's got to take you out of a position of faith. The first step to stepping out of a walk of faith is becoming eye-focused, sight-focused, observing what your eyes see. Now you understand how he comes to you at night, and what's he do? He describes your situation to you. Same thing. It's like Goliath. The Bible even tells us, like, look how big he is. Look how big. Man, even his coat of mail. Here's what Satan does. He goes, man, what did the bank say yesterday? Yeah, how in the world is that going to happen? You're going to lose your house. Your wife's going to leave you now because you've failed one too many times. Your kids will never respect you. Your whole life's falling apart. What did the doctor say? Ooh, what's the percentage of some? Yeah, that's too much. What's he doing? He's trying to get you out of faith, so he's going to take a physical, earthly, materialistic circumstance, describe it to you so that you will behold it. Because what you observe, you empower in your life. You only have faith and fear. You observe his words, his circumstance, you're empowering fear. It doesn't mean you don't ignore it. You recognize things exist, but you don't give them real estate in your mind. I play golf, and I'm amazing, actually, Ed. I'm really good at golf. Actually, it's funny because I'm really amazing, like, every three games. You know, if you play golf, you know what I mean. You can, you can think you're going to the PGA one week and then shoot like 30 strokes higher than you did the week before and not know why, okay? So I say I'm good at golf because I have, I, the last two weeks I've been playing amazing. I just said that, so now next week I'll probably shoot 150. But the point is, is in golf, one of the things we learn is don't give credence or focus to all of the hazards, the worst, if you want to tick somebody off, you're playing golf with them. Here's what you do. You stand up, you're on a par three, and there's a big thing, a pond of water between you and the green. And they're getting ready to hit, and you're like, man, that water, don't hit the water, man. Don't, don't look at the water. Hit right over the water. Come on, you can do this. What are they doing? You're now drawing his heart, his mind. Everything's thinking about, I cannot hit the ball in the water. If you think about not hitting the ball in the water, you will, your body can't help it. It's like your mind's there, and it's like, okay, I won't do it, I won't do it, I won't do it, I won't do it, and you're going to hit it right in the water. You want to fight addiction and sin in your life? Quit maximizing it in your mouth. 
I'm not going to do that again. I'm not going to sin again. I'm not going to do that again. I'm not going to smoke again. I'm not going to drink again. I'm not going to cuss again. I'm not going to do that. What are you doing? You are beholding sin, not beholding Jesus. You're empowering the addiction in your life, or you're empowering bondage in your life. Are you maximizing the work of the enemy or who Jesus is and what he did? Instead of saying, I'm never going to do that again, I'm never going to do that, I'm never going to do that, just fall in love with Jesus. And guess what? You won't want to do that again. But Satan says, you did it again. You, that's 58 times in the last six months. I've been counting in case you forgot. Why do you keep doing that? What's he doing? He's drawing you away so that fear will take over a work of faith in your life. Always saying, hey, look at the water. Hey, look at that. So don't allow this description to take what you're thinking about. And I'm telling you, if you notice when you're battling something in fear, I remember there was a season in my life, uh, so I, when I say this from a pulpit, people are like, man, I can't believe you said that. And then I have about 30 people come up to me and be like, I battled the same thing. Thank you for sharing that. I had a season in my life, um, I think it was in my late 20s, where I just got attacked and I battled the fear of death. I don't know if anyone's ever been in this season, but the fear of death. It's not that I didn't believe in eternal life and all that, but it was just like physical death, you know, it, and it was right after my boys were born. So it could be something like, man, I'm a father now, I have responsibilities, and just the enemy just came in and said, yeah, but you're not going to see him grow up. No, you're not. And he played on every access point that he had in my life. And it sounds crazy unless you've been in it, but the worst thing you can do is Google what you're going through. Google your symptoms because he somehow got me to do that and I had these weird symptoms. But by the way, they were, it's funny because afterwards you look back and you're like, I can't believe I fell for that. But in the moment, I did. I had these weird pains everywhere and stuff. And by the way, you can give yourself symptoms. I learned that too. I, I, because it's, when I Googled it, I was like, well, why am I having this? And then I like read, and, and of course, I don't know why Google does this, but every time you Google something, it's like, you're dying. That's like the first thing that comes up. It's like, everyone died who had that. You know, I'm like, man, how is that? Let me go to the next page. Everyone died who had that. And then I'm like, and then it goes on to describe the symptoms. And I'm like, I had that. I have that one too. I have that one too. I don't have those three. Two days later, those three show up in my life. Now I've got all the symptoms. And it sounds funny now, but the enemy utilized that to take the teeth out of my faith in that season of life. I was so afraid of death, and I thought I was dying of a disease. I remember my wife would be asleep. My boys were just babies at the time. And I mean, the enemy just had it. I mean, he was, he's good at what he does. He knows what gets to you. And I remember looking at the boys sleeping, and I'm like, and I'm thinking, I'm like, I wonder if their stepdad's going to be a good guy. I hope Courtney, I mean, it's crazy now, but I was like, I don't even know. I mean, I, I can't see her marrying somebody else. And man, I get, maybe I should write them a letter so that way they can at least know how I was. I mean, like all of these thoughts, you know, I was like, maybe I should film more videos or, I mean, the enemy had convinced me of this. And I'm telling you this because we all go through it in different phases of our life, different seasons. It might not be a fear of death. It could be a fear of anything, lack or a fear of failure or fear of opinions of man, or what people think, or your peers are trying to fit in. Whatever it is, you give him an inch, he'll take a mile. Don't play with fear. Don't compromise with fear in any way. And here's something that I'm going to give you for free. If you ever make a decision and fear is even 1% of that decision, don't make the decision. If you're going to do something, you're like, well, you know, it sounds like a good idea, but what if I miss out? Or if fear is, is even motivating part of it, don't. I'm not saying it might not be the right direction. Never make a decision while fear is involved, ever, because the enemy leads us through fear. So if he knows he can take some fear and he can direct your path with fear, then he can now lead your life. I've said it before from the pulpit. I said, what if I threw now, uh, if I had you come stand up, I said, hey, I need a volunteer. And you were the volunteer. You come stood up the, uh, on the stage. And then I took uh, a big basket. And you're like, oh, man, it must be a really cool prize. And then I opened the basket and threw the contents of the basket at your feet. And it was a king cobra snake, you know, one of the most deadly or something like that. And I'm like, this is going to be a great example. Everybody watch this. And I threw it down. And you're like, I'm in the wrong church, man. It's too late now, though. So, And that cobra comes up. And, man, that cobra is now mad because I threw it out of the basket. So it slapped its head on the deal and it thinks you did all that. And it's like, oh, we're going to fight now. And so that cobra's looking at you and it's coming after you. What's going to happen? Are you going to walk the direction of where the snake is? Don't act super tough. I don't care. You aren't scared. Of it. You would not walk over the cobra no matter how tough you are. We'd all be like, yeah, I'm going to go this way. That's cool. I don't want to, I'm going to go to the Baptist church down the road. No, it's cool. I don't know. Life church is weird. So you're going to move away from the obstacle that's bringing fear. So if I want you to go that direction, and you're going this direction, and I'm Satan, I go, hey, here's what I'll do. 
they're afraid of snakes. I'll put a snake in their path. And because fear runs them and rules their life because they're not allowing faith, they're not hearing the word, and they're not meditating on God, then this fear of this thing in their path is going to make them turn around and go the other direction because I need them over there. So now he places what you're afraid of in your life. What are they going to think? You'll never be the leader I've called, God's called you to be because you're too concerned about your peers. So I'm going to place that pressure in front of you. Do you see how sly he is? He knows you won't listen to him. He can't say, hey, do it out. Go my way. I'm the devil. You're like, no, nah, I'm going to go the other way. But fear is how he leads. So now he works that way. He says, I'm just going to bring this. So if fear and faith work through observation, let me say it like this. Fear works by anticipation with observation. You're observing something. You're anticipating failure or what the result of fear is. And so now fear is getting strong in your life. Someone said before, fear is false evidence appearing real. Have you ever heard that before? F-E-A-R, right? Or meditation on the wrong information, fear. What are you doing? You're thinking about the wrong thing, and now you're empowering fear through anticipating its results. So once again, Satan is the same. He says, I'm going to take the most imposing warrior I have of my Nephilim army here. I'm going to have him go down the middle. He's a giant. He's like a, you know, uh, X-Men or what is that? I keep wanting to say Amazon. Why did I say Amazon? What's the name? Marvel. Because it has a V, a Z. Not even the same thing. Okay, so I was thinking of DC because it's better than Marvel. But anyways, the point is, is I was picturing these superheroes. And I'm like, hey, we can, we can now, if that offended you, take it. All right? Superman, Batman are better than all those like, new guys. Except Iron Man. He's cool. So, and he's going to put Goliath in front of you, and it's going to now stop Israel from taking. Can I tell you something? The mountain that the Philistines were on was a mountain God gave to Israel. So they're on their territory, and the way Satan keeps you from moving in God's direction is he puts fear in front of you and diverts your path. So now we're not going to take the rest of the land God wants us to have. We're not going to take that mountain. We'll just take the mountain next to us. It's all right. No problem. Compromise. They're making decisions based on fear. Fear is the substance of things avoided. Let me give it to you like this. Hebrews 11.1 1 says this. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So Satan's always bringing a counterfeit. So here's Satan's Hebrews 11.1. 1. Fear is the substance of things avoided, the threat of things not seen. He's saying it's, it's like you're just playing the whole thing out. You don't even know how it's going to end, but the threat of the failure or that fear coming to pass is giving substance to the fear in your life. So David saw that fear was empowering Goliath on behalf of the Israelites. So Goliath was a giant and an obstacle to the Israelites, but David had a different spirit. He was just different. I mean, his brothers were all normal, and he was different. He was, he was just always out there. So he saw everything different. So as Goliath was an obstacle, David saw him as an opportunity. As Goliath was a result of fear and redirecting the people of God, David said, wait a second. If, if, if fear is what's keeping us from taking that mountain, then that tells me the very thing we should be doing is taking that mountain because it's in the direction of where the enemy doesn't want us to go. Satan's going to try to divert you out of, you know what, when God says, I want you to take that next step in your walk with me, share your faith or get in the word more, whatever it might be, be a leader in your family, be the spiritual leader of your family, start reading the Bible with your kids, whatever it might be, be an, a leader at your school, stand up, pray at lunch, tell people, hey, don't talk like that, we're, man, we're not going to act that way, whatever it is, when God's trying to stretch you in your walk of faith, the enemy will always put fear to try to deter you, and it's a sign that's territory he's on he doesn't want you to have. So instead of diverting your path, you do the opposite of what the enemy wants you to do. And you say, I'm going to take the land you're standing on. You have to supplant fear and its hold on your life. The second point, and there's only three, don't worry, is faith and fear can't cooperate. I didn't say cooperate is one word. I want you to hear it, cooperate. Faith and fear can't cooperate. If you're operating in one, the other one's neutralized in your life. If you're walking in faith, you're not walking in fear. If fear is leading you, you are not, not halfway. Oh, I'm still in faith. I got one foot on one side. No, you're either in fear or faith. Jesus said, you're for me or against me. 
I mean, there's light and darkness. There's not a gray kingdom. There's either a kingdom of light and a kingdom of darkness, and that's it. So we can't straddle the fence. Fear can't be tolerated. Well, I'm just fear. It's just a small thing. I'm not afraid of anything except this, and that's fine because, you know, fear helps you be wise. I've heard whole people teach on this, like, fear's a good thing because it tells you, you know, what could hurt you. It's like, no, that's a deception of the enemy. Never allow fear. Wisdom is a good thing and tells you what not to do that's foolish for you, but don't let fear motivate you. In Luke 8, 50, going to give you a quick description of a story. You can read it later. Uh, Jesus is walking through a crowd of people, and this is for the faith and fear can't cooperate. I want you to see this. He's walking through a crowd of people, and a man named Jairus came down. He's the leader of the synagogue, and he falls at Jesus' feet and says, Jesus, my daughter is dying. Please come and lay your hands on her. I know she'll live if you come and pray for my daughter. She's at death's door. Jesus says, I'll go with you. He starts walking with them, and then the story shifts to a woman with an issue of blood. She made her way through the crowd. She's crawling on her hands and feet. She's pressing through, and this is not 12 people, 20 people. Thousands of people followed Jesus many times everywhere that he went just to touch him. Perhaps they would get a miracle. Can you imagine the chaos that scenario would look like? People are, why? Because they're enraptured with fear, and they're thinking, hey, this is another shot I've got. I'll try Jesus because I have nothing left to give. Fear is going crazy, and they're thinking, let's just touch Jesus and see what happens. This lady looked at Jesus different than everybody else. She said, if I could just make contact with Jesus, I know I'll be fine. What's she saying? All I need to do is be in proximity. All I need to do is be in unity with the Messiah. I know who he is. Once I get in his presence and I make contact with him, everything will be okay. Everybody else was touching Jesus, got nothing. I've said this in a different sermon before. I said, everybody else was wanting Jesus to touch them, and this woman touched Jesus. And there's a difference. It's like, man, Lord, do something for me. Lord, touch me. Lord, I need peace. Lord, I need this. And she was like, Lord, I just need you. And when I get you, I have everything else. Maybe your prayer should be, Lord, I just want more of you because he is the Prince of Peace. He is the great physician or the healer. He has everything you need. So if you're seeking his hand, you're praying amiss. You're praying wrong. You should seek him and then recognize that when you get him, you get his hand. He already died for it all. So we sometimes chase the wrong things. Fear and faith can't cooperate. So what happens? Jairus said, oh, Jesus is coming. This woman touches him, power leaves Jesus without him. And I believe even though he's God, he allowed himself not to see this moment because he was showing the people and teaching them something. He says, who touched me? And his disciples said, Jesus, there's 12,000 people all around. I got slapped in the face three times. This lady touched you in the hair. She pulled your shirt. This guy fell in front of, what do you mean who's touching you, Lord? I mean, I can matter if one of the disciples were me, I'd be freaking out. I'm like, everybody's breathing in your face and coughing everywhere and touching, and they're all sick. So you're like, man, I'm in the middle of this sick crowd of people that are all screaming, and they're in the middle. And he goes, why would you say that? I love it when Jesus did things that he knew his disciples would be like, what? He's like, who touched me? They're like, and he goes, no, there's a difference between just making contact physically and touching with the touch of faith. Somebody touched me with faith, and faith pulls power out of heaven. It's the way you receive from heaven. Fear pulls power out of the kingdom of darkness. So he said, someone touched me with faith, power left me. And then the woman fell at his feet and said, it was me. And she said, and she told him the whole story and tried everything. And I just want to make contact if I can just touch him. And now power left. And he said something very interesting. He said, woman, your faith has made you whole. Now this is interesting because he didn't just say, I made you whole. I would have said that. I'd be like, yeah, I'm God. I made you whole. Yes, you touched me. I have everything you need. Just because we're prideful as humans. So that's how I would have said it. But he said, no, your faith. Why? Because everybody was in the proximity of God. They were all touching the Messiah. But her faith is what drew the power out of him. Then we go on. The Jairus is sitting here, and, and he's thinking, my daughter's dying. This is this long conversation. Please hurry it up. The guys come and say, never mind. Leave me alone. She already died. He took too long with this lady with the issue of blood. She's already dead. And Jesus says, hang on, stop. In the middle of their conversation, he says, Jairus, don't listen to that. Listen to what Jesus did. He goes, fear not. Their report is going to bring fear. Don't think about your daughter being dead. He said, fear not. Only believe, and your daughter shall be made well. So he's saying here, if you stay in faith and don't fear, she'll be raised from the dead. 
because faith is how you receive from me. So he did not allow Jairus to behold their conversation, think about his daughter dying, and go down that path. He goes, stop right there. Look at me, Jairus. Just keep your eyes on me. Stay in faith. Why? Because you're going to see a miracle. And then, of course, when they went to her house, what happened? Jesus raised her from the dead. Everybody was crying, saying, you're too late. And faith drew power out of heaven. The woman with the alabaster box, the same thing. Jesus told her, your faith has saved you. What is he saying? Your faith saves, heals, and delivers you. Here's the point number three. So faith and fear can't cooperate. So you're either in fear, you don't receive, or you're in faith, you receive. The third point is the most important. I want you to catch this. Faith and fear are spiritual delivery systems. Spiritual delivery systems. You want to receive packages from God? Faith is the only way to receive what God has delivered to us on the cross. You can't receive the salvation Jesus died to give you unless your faith is in him as Savior. But guess what? You can have faith in him as Savior, but not have faith in him as healer. And so now he saved you, but you can't see him as your healer. And so you're not able to receive with your faith the healing he died for you to have. The Bible also tells us in Philippians that he died to give you provision, not People get so spiritual. Oh, it's all spiritual. No, the Bible says it's earthly provision in this life. He says, all your needs are met according to what I have, my riches and glory. But if you see him as healer and savior, but not provider, then your faith can't access his provision in your life. You can be in fear with provision and in faith with your eternal salvation. You can't be in fear and faith about the same thing. Lord, I can receive from you, but I'm still questioning it. You're not going to receive. Faith is abandons everything. It says, I don't care how I look, what happens, I'm only going for you. I'm going to make contact with Jesus. So look at Proverbs 4.23, and we'll close with this. And I want you to catch this because in this season of life, the world is going to get crazier, and you cannot tolerate fear in any way. I remember uh, when, we were, when the boys were young, another thing the enemy would say is your kids are, are going to uh, stop breathing. It's funny, when we first had kids, I saw every article, and we saw every commercial, and we saw everything about kids dying in their cribs. I don't know. All of a sudden, it was like some infant death thing. or SIDS, Yeah. And so, I mean, the doctor's like, hey, you got to be careful because this. I was like, uh, okay, yeah, that's not a good thing. And then I was like, hey, have you ever wanted, do you have small children? Guess what can happen if they turn over and don't whatever. And so I remember the enemy was just like, your kids are going to die young. So now you're going to die young. Now Courtney's going to have to have more kids, find another husband. Y'all are all going to be gone. I was like, ah. Oh. So I'd be like going in there at night, checking if they're breathing. Come on, anyone do that before? You're like, and then you don't feel their breath. And you're like, ah, you know, and you like wake them up. Ah you're like, oh, okay, at least they're breathing, you know. Why'd you wake them up? I just, you don't want to know. So, but you now act on it. Here's what I want you to say. Never act in fear because you're allowing the enemy territory in your life. When you're doing that, your fear is now saying, here's an open door to what you want to do, Satan. So guess what? The good news is when fear comes, ne- expose it immediately, even if the temptation's there to give into it. Babe, I'm afraid about this. I know that's fear and I don't want to give into it. Okay, great. Then you now have accountability because when the enemy can get you trained to react to the snake in your path, the obstacle, he can direct your life out of the will of God. I mean, people always say, you know, well, I was the most afraid at ever public speaking, and they're one of the greatest speakers in the world. Whatever it is, he's going to use that to divert you in your life. So they're delivery systems. Now, I want to close with this thought, and I hope this really helps wrap everything up. You know, uh, if, if faith and fear like, delivery systems in our life. I want to talk about the heart because in the very beginning I said your heart is where your mouth speaks. It's what everything comes out of. The Bible says as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. That means the reality of your heart is the real reality of your life. And Proverbs 4.23 says it like this, guard your heart. To guard or keep means like with an attitude, right? It means like don't touch it. Stay away. Satan, no, nope, no, nope, I'm going to only allow what's good in here. To guard means to be keenly aware of something. So your heart, what's going into your heart, the Bible says you should be keenly focused on what goes in your heart. I've taught my boys this. What goes in your eyes and in your ears is a direct planting into your heart. So what you allow your eyes to see, you can't help it. If you're beholding it, it's going to plant it in your heart. You you cannot let yourself behold the things of darkness because you'll bring toxic poison into your heart and sabotage the entire plan of God for your life. That sounds extreme because it is. 
You cannot play with the enemy. He's had thousands of years to perfect this. The addictions that you're dealing with in your life, it's because you've allowed yourself to behold somewhere those things. Hearing. People say it's not a big deal what you hear. It's one of the most influential things in your life is what you hear. Because if faith comes by hearing the word, then how do you think fear comes? So you cannot allow, you're like, well, the music's not a big deal. I'm going to jump on it. I don't care if you get offended and go to the Baptist church down the street. doesn't matter. Here's the deal. You have to guard your heart with all you have. Listen to the lyrics of the music you're listening to. Because you don't know why I'm over here dealing with this, and you haven't ever put the two together, that you have pumped your heart full of darkness, and you have no faith, understanding, or victory in your life. It could be from what you're hearing. It could be from what you're beholding. It could be a person you're allowing to speak and you're listening to them. Slap them across the face and say, don't talk anymore. If they're speaking, not really, but I mean like spiritually speaking, you know, don't let them bring destruction into your heart any longer. Every system spiritually has intake and outflow. So Proverbs 4.23, guard your heart with all diligence for out of it spring the borders or the issues of your life. That means your life is framed in and described. Imagine a picture frame. The picture frame contains the picture. Everything outside of the frame is not the picture. So your life, the borders, that word issues means borders in Hebrew. The borders of your life are framed by what's in your heart. That means your life will never proceed beyond the borders your heart allows it to. So if you don't keenly keep guard over your heart and what you meditate on and what goes into it, then your life is going to be a picture of exactly what the enemy wants it to be. He'll keep you small and not allow you to cross the mountain and take the other side because Goliath is keeping you in there. Every spiritual system, your heart's a spiritual system. It's meant to take what it's fed and make a reality. What you're feeding your heart, your actions have to follow, your words. So your reality, this is going to get deep, is just a result of the harvest of what's in your heart. Your marriage is a result of the harvest of your marriage internally in your heart. Your family situation, your business is all an outgrowth of your heart's borders and how it frames pictures in your life. You cannot act outside of your heart. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So you, you can't take it any more serious than I'm trying to say it. It's intake and outflow. Think about systems, like cars. For, the car is a system, right? It has an intake, right? You put gas in the system of a car, and then it has an outflow, nitric oxides, you know, all the stuff that comes out the exhaust. So everything that has function takes something in and something goes out. You breathe in oxygen, what do you breathe out? Carbon dioxide. You eat food, you eliminate waste. Intake, I said waste because I was trying to keep mature. Intake and outflow in our life. So you ready for this? Just like a car. Whatever you intake is going to be what propels your life. You're fueling your life with what your eyes see, your ears hear, and that goes into your heart. You want to be victorious in this season, this year? I said every Sunday I'm going to prepare you for what God's doing in 2024. We are in a year of open doors, miraculous moves of God in our life. You've got to change your diet. Your heart has to change what it's been eating, seeing, and beholding in your life. So what did David do? He didn't behold Goliath. What did he behold? 1 Samuel 17, two more verses, and then we'll end it here. 1 Samuel 17, verse 26. So we have Goliath. David's going, hey, what's the deal here? Who's this Goliath? Oh, man, he's a giant. And so they go through the whole story. Hey, there's like a prize for whoever beats him. You don't have to pay taxes. You get the king's daughter. David's like, that's positive. What's he thinking about? All the good stuff. He's like, king's daughter, no taxes. We serve the one true God. He serves the devil. I don't see why everybody's depressed. This is actually exciting. And then it says in verse 36, it says, uh, he, he goes to Saul, and, and Saul says, you got to wear my armor. And David's like, I can't wear your armor. I, we don't need armor. Here's the deal. Verse 36, your servant has killed lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Now look real quick, because this is going to get really good as we close. Verse 36, 
I just read that. Verse 26. I said 26 and I read it out of order. Okay, verse 26. It says, Then David spoke to the man who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of God? Once again, verse 36. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Why does he say uncircumcised? Because circumcision was the sign of a covenant with God. So if you were circumcised, you had a covenant with the God of Israel, the only true God. And when you have a covenant with the creator of the universe, why are you afraid about a small obstacle in the way of what the creator of the universe has called you to possess? He's thinking, he doesn't have a covenant. We do. So instead of thinking of the fear and the obstacle and the description and describing darkness, Genesis 1, and the chaos... He's like, God, what is he doing? He's not describing the situation. He is now keeping the promise of God in front of him. And he's saying, he has no covenant. We have a covenant. So we're going to win anyways. And we get all this bonus stuff just for believing what God already said we know is going to come to pass, going to pass. This is a win-win for me. So he says, I'll be fine. I don't need anything because God's going to fight for us. Not me. God's going to do it. I'll go with my little slingshot, my stones. He was 16 or 17 at the time, David, teenage boy. Why are they always teenagers? Another sermon. So a teenager goes out, he goes, and, and all the armies of Israel are watching him. They're like, uh, this is not good. Like, we had like a lot of better, you know, candidates to send out here. Now they're embarrassed because the Philistines, not only are they, um, um, uh, confident they can defeat Israel, but now they're mocking the armies of Israel because a kid comes out. Can you imagine? Send me your best. He's the G's laughing. And they're like, okay, hang on. And this kid goes out with no armor, no sword or nothing. He's like, this is the best y'all have? Yes, the king. The seed of David is going to come from this man right here. He's got the Messiah in his descendants. Just watch. And David comes out and Goliath starts mocking him. He goes, what am I, dog? Are you going to, uh, you're going to insult me? At least let's have something that doesn't look embarrassing like this little kid, and he starts to laugh. Wrong mistake. This is not a good situation for Goliath. So we're going to read. I, actually, I told we're done reading, but I'm just going to read. So forgive me. Okay. Then it says, he took his staff in his hand and five smooth stones from the shepherd's bag. This is verse 40. Put him in a pouch that he had with a sling in his hand. He drew neither Philistine. This is so good. Watch this. He doesn't give in to fear. He's now walking in faith. You think Dave was like, I hope this works as he was walking up? No. I bet he was mocking Goliath the whole time, like, yeah, exactly. Dude, this is going to be so much fun. I'm going to slap, I'm going to slap your mother after this. I mean, it's going to be a terrible situation. It says in verse 41, the Philistines came and began drawing near to David. And the man who bore the shield went before the Philistine. And when the Philistine asked, this is Goliath, and saw David, he said, are you going to send me a youth? At least he said he was good looking. I mean, like he complimented him that way. And it says, verse 43, so the Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Not a good idea. And then it says, The Philistine, verse 44, said to David, Come to me, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. You ready for this? This is the, this is the shouting part. Stand up so that you can shout, because you're, you're going to want to shout here. Verse 45. We're going to close. If you stand up, I'll preach less. Okay. <laughs> verse 45. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of the angel armies, the God of armies of Israel, whom you have just insulted and defied. This day I will deliver you into my hand. I will strike you, take your head from you, and this day give your carcass to the king camp of the Philistines and the birds of the air, the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God, the God, the only God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord doesn't save with a sword and the spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. Can you imagine the Israelites behind him like David? Quit talking, right, dude. Right. This is getting worse. You're making it worse. And he's saying, this day, I'm going to cut your head off. Can you imagine the confidence? Why? Do you see fear anywhere in David? Because you cannot have access to the power of God without faith. So David's jumping. He's the only one out of the entire army of Israel that's walking in faith. One with the issue of blood. Only one out of the entire crowd that was approaching God in faith. Have you noticed a pattern here? Those that are in faith receive from God. Verse 48, so it was when the Philistine arose and came near to meet David that he hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. 
Goliath is walking, David's running at him. Now, then David put his hand in his bag, took out a stone, slung it, and struck the Philistine on his forehead so that the stone stank into his forehead, and he fell forward on his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and stone, struck him, killed him, and there was no sword in the hand of David. Verse 51. So David ran over, stood over the Philistine, took his own sword from him, drew it out of his sheath. Now, remember how big his his spear was. Imagine how big the sword is. David's a teenager. So he's like dragging this, you know, 80 pound sword, pulling it up like this. I mean, it was probably a sight to see. And he says, he took it and killed him, cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. How do you deal with fear? You cut its head off. What does that mean? The root of what's causing it to speak to you has to be silenced. So whatever fear is using to say what it's been saying to you, you have to cut that off. Jesus said it's better to cut your hand off than offend one of these little ones. What are you saying? Do not allow the enemy to have any access points to your life. Just cut it off. It doesn't matter how extreme it seems. It's, more, it's better for you to cut it off now than for it to infect your entire life. I love this part. Then it says in verse 52, Now the men um, of Israel and Judah arose, shouted, and pursued the Philistines as far as the entrance of the valley of the gates of Ekron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell along the road, even as it was far as Gath and Ekron. Verse 53, then the children of Israel returned from chasing the Philistines, and they plundered their tents. Can you see the faith now rising in everybody else? One man walks by faith. Everybody else sees the results. Now they all get attitudes, and now they're chasing them. Verse 54, David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent. When Saul, David going out, when Saul saw David going out against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of the army, whose son is this? And he said, uh, he inquired who he was, and he goes on to say, I'm the son of Bethlehemite. But it says that David took the head of Goliath and went around the entire city showing everybody the head of Goliath. That's something a teenager would do, right? He's like, yeah, look what God did. And he's, can you imagine it? Like walking into Subway, look what God did. Everywhere, you're like, yeah, everywhere. What's he doing? He is doing the opposite of what fear does. Fear keeps it in front of you, speaks it to you. You hear it, you hear it, you observe it, you observe it. Now he's saying, let's build faith in the people. Let's take what the fear was observed, they were observing, and let's now let them see faith instead of the fear. Look at the defeat of the fear giant that you were afraid to cross. Now we have victory. Faith rose in the whole nation. They took that mountain back. So here's what I'm telling you. This world is getting crazier. Don't. Iran attacked Israel. What's going to happen? Oh, gosh, I don't know. I, I'm uneasy about all this. What are people going to think? God's saying, I want you to be a leader at your school. Yeah, but I, I won't be popular. Or what if people don't, what if they laugh at me? Or what if I do something? Fear. You give in to fear, you get all the results that Satan wants for you. It's always ending in destruction. Whatever it is in your life, this business situation, yeah, but what if it doesn't happen? What if I invest this money in what God told me to do and something happens? If fear is a part of the decision, freeze. I mean, let's just play, what is that game where everybody freezes? Freeze tag. Oh, that was deep. I thought it was like Simon Says. No, that's a different game. Anyway, freeze tag. So that means you're making a decision. Wait, what if, and you start moving. I'm going to go check my kids, see if they're breathing. Don't do that. Why are you inviting that into your family? I already made that mistake. Don't do it. Freeze right there and go, if it's fear, I'm not, I'm not even going to allow the enemy to take me in that direction. We are living the greatest season the world has ever seen. Jesus is coming soon, and it's getting fun. And I'm telling you, the Lord told me this year, open doors. You're going to see what we've been talking about. You can partake in what we've been talking about, or you can watch other people partake in it. But either way, your faith qualifies you, and fear disqualifies you. You could be going to heaven and disqualified by fear. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you, Lord, that faith would rise in your people this morning. Lord, I pray that you would cause us to shake off spiritual complacency. Lord, forgive us, Father, for giving in to all of the feeding of the fear of the world and letting our hearts be planted with seeds of doubt and unbelief and darkness and any fruits of the enemy. Lord, I pray that this morning that we would guard our heart, be diligent, Lord, be watching over it, Father, only allowing the seed of your word and of your truth and of your plan, God, your will being done in our life, not the will of the enemy. Our hearts belong to you, Jesus. And I thank you that our actions and our words will just be fruit that confirm the purity, the faith, and the light that's in our hearts. Lord, I pray that your people would not be satisfied with just enough or not enough, that they would not give in to any type of compromise in their life this year. 
Lord, we are yours, dedicated to you. And I thank you, Lord, that the entire world will take notice of the body of Christ in the next two years, Lord. What you're doing with all the deception, the fake peace, the chaos, all the fear, Lord, that you are going to cause your church to rise to the top and that when the darkness is at its greatest, Lord, we know that light shines its brightest, Father. So let your people shine in this season. Lord, we love you. Thank you for what you're doing. In Jesus' name. And everyone said... Amen. Amen. Amen.